Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, where our mission is to empower people to make better lives, use authentic voice, and build common understanding. My name is Martin Ludden. I'm the executive director of the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, and tonight we're working on building common understanding with our uh, longtime partner, the League of Women Voters of St. Paul. We are here tonight for a Senate District 64 candidate forum for our House seats A and B, and I would like to welcome all of you who are here in studio with us and also those of you watching at home live on Channel 19. Um, and with that, I'm gonna get out of the way and hand it over to Sarah Risser from the League to continue with the forum. Thank you. So my name is Sarah Risser and I am a member of the St. Paul League of Women Voters and I will be your moderator tonight. Tonight's forum is sponsored by the St. Paul Neighborhood uh, Network, the League of Women Voters St. Paul, Union Park, and the Mac Groveland and Highland District Councils. We believe the state of Minnesota's ability to thrive in the face of new and daunting challenges depends on the values, knowledge, and commitment of its elected officials. Thus, it is essential for the public to better understand the views, opinions, and commitments of people running for elected office in Minnesota. It is this understanding that better equips voters with information to make informed voting decisions. We ask that you all be respectful of one another and of the candidates. Disruptive behavior such as name calling, personal attacks, talking out of turn, or not abiding by timekeeping rules will result in your being asked to leave the forum. Cards and pencils have been placed on everyone's chair. Please use these cards to write questions for the candidates. Once you have written a question, hold up your card and a volunteer will come and pick it up from you. All of the candidates who are here tonight have, agree have agreed to forum rules as included in their invitation to participate. The forum will begin with each candidate giving a two-minute introductory statement. The order in which they speak has been randomly determined. After the introductory statements, the question and answer portion of the, forums, of the forum will begin. The candidates will have one minute to answer questions and, if necessary, 30 seconds for a rebuttal after each candidate has had the opportunity to answer the question. After the question and answer session, each candidate will be given an additional two minutes for a closing statement. A timer will signal them when they have 15 seconds remaining and when their time is up. And that's true for the opening statement, the closing statement, and the questions during the forum. We will accept written questions throughout the forum. Questions submitted by the audience must not be personal in nature and must be on topics relevant for the, uh, for the office. All questions must be addressed to all candidates. Please remain as quiet as possible so that everyone may hear, and please hold your applause until the forum has ended so that candidates will have as much time as possible to answer your questions. And please place your cell phones on silent. With that, we will start with our opening statements. Candidates, you each have two minutes for your opening statement, and we will begin with Patrick. So, hello everybody. I guess my name is Patrick Griffin. I'm the endorsed Republican candidate for District 64A. And I think a little bit more important to understanding who I am and what I believe is the fact that I'm a recent graduate from the University of Minnesota, where I studied uh, genetics and plant biology. So during my time there, I was, I'll admit that my beliefs differed greatly from a lot of my peers around me. And so speaking with those peers, I was forced to consider 
think about, discuss, change, challenge, and improve my ideas across the, the three and a half years I spent there. And in doing so, I think I realized the value of genuine, honest discussion. And so when it came to running this campaign, I think especially given our hostile political climate, that's what I kind of wanted to base this campaign around. So I'm running essentially on a platform of what can we do from a legislative standpoint that would help improve our discussions with one another, both between citizens, between citizens and their government, and within government itself. For that purpose, that's why I'm just very excited to be here, because this is exactly what I think is important and what we need more of, is candidates talking with their constituents and then constituents being able to talk to the candidates. Uh, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the League of Women Bo Voters, and thank you for you all to come out here. I'm excited for the rest of the evening. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Kali? Thank you, Sarah. So my name is Kali Hur, and I am the DFL endorsed candidate for House C64A. I appreciate the invitation to be here today. A little bit about myself. Um, I am a mother of two girls. I am a wife. I am a daughter to parents who are aging. And I am the product of public schools, uh, pu um, public assistance, and the generosity of faith groups who took my family in as refugees that came to this country over 40 years ago. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here because I'm not like most people who tend to run for office, that I decided that I would do this because of my love and my passion for people and the injustice or the issues that I was seeing all around me. That as a mother who worked in the private sector in uh, finance and investments for 15 years, that I decided that I would stay home and be with my children for, uh, and in that time, I really reevaluated what it meant for me to be somebody who would be a contributing member of society. And as I watched my children grow, as I was advocating for them in public education, I realized that I had the privilege of time, privilege of education, privilege in language, and yet I was having difficulties navigating uh, uh, education institutions for my children. And it was because of that that I realized that I couldn't just fight every day for my own children, that I couldn't be in the schools just for my kids, and that it was my duty, my responsibility, because of everything that had been invested into me, it was my turn to invest in all of the children of St. Paul and all of the families in St. Paul and all of the people who were advocating for their aging parents as well. And then it was my turn to really fight for all of those people and that everyone was my parents, all the children in St. Paul were my children, and that I would feel really honored to be the DFL endorsed candidate and to be able to be here tonight with all of you. So thank you. Great, thank you. Dave. I'm Dave Pinto. I'm the state representative for uh, Highland Park, McAllister, Groveland, uh, West 7th area, District 64B, and I'm just finishing my second term, and it's been an honor to be in that role. I want to thank the League of Women, of Women Voters uh, and the other sponsors um, for putting this candidate forum together. Uh, I've been a longtime resident of the district. My wife, uh, Abby, and I have two kids in the public schools, and I work outside the legislature as a prosecutor of gender violence, domestic violence, sexual exploitation, and sex trafficking. Um, and in the legislature, my couple terms, I've been um, in the minority, but have um, really worked um, to try to make a difference in a number of areas. Um, my top legislative uh, area of focus has been early childhood, helping to get every child off to a great start. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Of course, I've worked in the area of public safety, um, and this uh, spring in particular was uh, very active uh, in the fight um, to prevent gun violence. And again, I suspect we'll get a chance to talk more about that in the course of the forum. Um, and more broadly, I've served as an assistant leader for the for the House DFL caucus um, in the mix in, in uh, working towards an agenda that, that lifts up families and communities. Uh, it's really important to me that we um, have a state where every single person, uh, whatever their background, has the chance to contribute and the chance to thrive. Um, again, for me, I've been focusing that work at the very beginning, uh, uh, the first couple of years, uh, making sure that every child gets off to that start and thinking that there's such a big payoff that we get from that work, um, but I've tried to, to continue to have that theme um, in all of my work, and I'm looking forward to the continued discussion in the course of the, uh, of the evening tonight. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dave. Alex. Thank you. My name is Alex Poliat. I am the Republican candidate for 64B. I'd also like to thank the League of Women Voters as well as the other sponsors. I'd like to thank the other candidates for coming up here as well. Um, it's a lot of time away from your friends, family, um, and things you love and enjoy. Um, it's a big sacrifice, and they do a lot of work to do better for our community. Um, I'm running because I know what it's like to work two jobs to pay off our student loans. Uh, I believe in this state. I think our best days are still ahead of us, and we've done a great job in this state. This is the state that was the first in line when Lincoln asked to protect the Union. We led the way. When science said you can't put a different person's heart in another person, we said you can, and we did. 
Minnesota has led the way in lots of innovations medically, business, our business communities. We've done a great job, and I want to be the next generation to continue our story in moving Minnesota forward. So thank you, and thank you all for coming out. I know the Vikings play, and um, I know that was probably tough for a lot of you, but thank you again. This is really important to our democracy for questions and uh, good conversation. Thank you. Great, thank you. That concludes our opening statements, and then we will now move into the question and answer uh, part of the forum. And to remind everyone, the candidates will have one minute to respond to each question. And the order uh, to, in which they answer the questions will be switched up with each question. Um, so the first question we have is about taxes. So Minnesota is one of the most taxed states in the nation. Do you think the tax rates in Minnesota are too high? Um, if so, what will you do to keep our taxes under control? And we're going to start with Alex. Well, thank you. I, I agree. Minnesota is well overtaxed. Uh, this last year, uh, we cut, actually, the last biennium, we had the largest tax cut in 20 years. $650 million in tax relief for everyday Minnesotans. And it was great for us college graduates. We actually had the first in the nation college tuition tax credit. And I benefited from that, and a lot of college kids did as well. We have a lot of work to do. The federal government just changed um, the tax codes, and Minnesota did not fully comply with the new federal tax codes, which would lower everyone's rates and make it a lot simpler and easier for people to do their taxes on their own. And now it's going to be very hard for people to do taxes because we haven't conformed to the federal government. Thank you. Great. Colleen. So I would like to actually maybe look at this question just a little bit differently. And I think about um, asking us the question of what is the quality of life we want here in Minnesota? And then we can say, are we being taxed too much? That I appreciate the fact that my children get quality education in public schools here in Minnesota. I appreciate the fact that I have a great environment uh, for me to operate in and that we have clean air and we have we protect our waters and we protect our our, our soil and so for me the, the uh, looking at are we paying too much in taxes I look at the quality of life that we have here in Minnesota and I believe that um, I am willing to pay taxes in order to maintain that quality of life great thank you Dave well, the federal tax law that was referenced is um, uh, was really tilted towards corporations and the wealthy, and the state um, uh, tax cuts that have gone through have really been tilted that way as well. Um, it's true that our state um, has traditionally been a, sort of a higher tax and higher service kind of state, um, and we've done really, really well um, in all kinds of ways, um, both in quality of life, but also just economically. If you compare it to some of the states around us, com compared to, to Wisconsin, um, uh, uh, our state has had really good economic performance, and there's been a lot of concern about um, the tax rates based on that. Um, but actually, it's um, gone very, very well for, uh, for corporations, for individuals, and others. Um, our state uh, and local taxes are actually regressive um, when you look at them. Folks who have um, higher incomes, in fact, pay a lower percentage of their income than do folks with a lower um, income. And so we definitely need to make some adjustments um, in, our, uh, in our tax system. But as we do that, we do need to keep in mind um, that uh, we are a state that's had that trade-off and that's worked out really, really well for, for us, both economically and, and in every other way as well. Great, thank you. Patrick? So I guess I would agree that welfare is kind of the focus for taxation, getting the most that you can out of each dollar that you spend. For me, what interests, what interests me is finding the maximum you know, kind of sustainable rate relative to the states around us and the rest of the country. Um, I know recently we've been suffering from corporate flight, and we've just lost another couple Fortune 500 headquarters from the Twin Cities area. And so for me, I guess that signals an unsustainable rate of taxation, which I think it has worked for us in the past, and it has given us good trade-offs. But as the country shifts around us, we have to be able to adapt to that too. And so maintaining as much business as we can, as much economic prosperity, while keeping tax rates where we can still provide the services that we value, I think that should be our target to figure out and any structural issues that might persist. We should fix those too. Great, thank you. So um, all of you are representing your, your constituents, live in the city of St. Paul, and the city of St. Paul has been struggling to um, house its residents. There have been more people moving in. There, there's not enough affordable housing. So I've already received two questions on this topic. How do you plan to address the affordable housing crisis in St. Paul? What can you do in your office to address this issue? And we're going to start with Dave. 
So um, uh, housing is kind of at the root of all sorts of issues. Uh, when I've uh, been focusing on issues involving little kids, uh, so much is dependent on that um, uh, and what happens with families. Um, uh, we need to, um, and clearly there is a, there's a, a market imperfection there. We're not providing enough housing um, for families. Um, and so um, there needs to be uh, uh, additions to the, the housing funds that are available um, that can be used um, to match private developers, um, to encourage, um, encourage the density that we've been seeing, such as at the Ford site um, and other locations. Um, we have a lot of people that are seeking to move into our city. That's a really good thing. Um, we need to make sure that we have um, the opportunity in the space um, uh, to be able to house them. Um, and so um, there's a, a recent report that came out um, through the Minnesota Housing Partnership um, and others talking about innovation in housing and, and other steps we can take, and we have a really short amount of time. But in general, I'm really supportive of those steps that are, that are recommended um, that our state take. Great, thank you. Patrick. So I guess I would agree with Dave that there is certainly a housing, housing shortage right now, but that I guess I wouldn't chalk it up to a market imperfection, but perhaps maybe over-involvement in the market in this case. I think there's a lot of concerns with integration and, and style and everything that have to be addressed and, and making sure that zoning laws are appropriate to the areas, but I think trying to figure out the best way to encourage that high-density housing that's beneficial both for families, for businesses, small businesses, labor, everything. So I think trying to figure out where we might be over-regulating that area, where you know maintaining safety standards and everything, where we can actually allow New, new development where we can allow higher density development. I think trying to open up that as much as we can for development is important, and I think that's the future of this metropolitan area. Great, thank you. Colleen. So today I had the, um, the privilege of being in a report out by Itasca. Um, they did a housing report, and I think that it's really important for us to remember that it is true that we actually, so the, the population in St. Paul has been steadily growing and we hit over 300,000 for the first time a few years ago since the 1970s. And so there is greater demand for housing, but there's not enough housing unit, which drives up the prices. And I think that um, for, uh, I agree with Dave that we need to have uh, greater incentive and partnerships with the uh, private uh, developers and institutions in order for us to, uh, to, um, to create uh, more housing units, but I also think that we need to be innovative in our thinking, that we have to stop looking at housing in the traditional way that we have, and that um, you know there are, are new opportunities to, um, to support uh, prefab homes or uh, tiny houses. How do we rehab in the spaces that we already have in order for us to put uh, more units that may be different that we've traditionally seen into those spaces? And so I would like to, uh, to really think about how can we be innovative in looking at our housing shortage. Great, thank you. Alex. Thank you. Uh, I agree with a lot of what was said. I think we do need uh, a government and private uh, uh, cooperation and making sure that we're building new age houses and moving forward and looking innovative ways to build housing. Uh, I don't think the government should be getting too involved in it. I think it's necessary, but not as not as heavily as what's been some of the proposals. But I'd like to see uh, private companies do a, a good job of moving and building houses and then making sure people have money and early education to make sure they're successful so they can afford the housing in the long the future. Okay, thank you. So the state of Minnesota has a relatively um, low incarceration rate compared to national statistics, but we do have a lot of people here who are serving out their sentences on probation or parole. Um, given that, do you believe uh, felons who are non-incarcerated should have the privilege to vote? And if so, what will you do to help ensure that this becomes a reality? We'll start with Coley. So I think that um, the, the, the answer is yes, I do believe that they have the right, they should have the right to vote. Um, I believe that there are people who have been incarcerated or who have records um, because of sometimes very low level offenses and that we can't make blanket statements as to who should have the ability to vote and who should not looking at the nuances of how people got into those situations. And so, yes, I do support that. And, um, I would, I'm looking, uh, when I'm thinking of specific legislation, I think that there's much that we can do. I mean, we've worked on uh, ban the box already, but there are still many, many things that we actually um, put in place in various to allow people to vote. And so what I'd like to do is, um, as a state legislature, I would look at all of the other options in which are preventing them from being able to, uh, to participate as full citizens, and that's where I would start. Great, thank you. Alex. Uh, thank you. 
So Minnesota actually has a, a different problem is the fact that our parole system is one of the longest serving paroles in the country. So our, our sentencing is longer. So I think we need to look at reforming the parole service and system to making sure that people serve their full sentence. I am open to the idea of exploring uh, in nonviolent offenders voting. Uh, I think we need, we have a problem with recidivism rates. I think they want to, we want people to be a part of our society. And I think this is a possibly a good step moving forward in, in doing that. So I'd be open to the idea of it. And I'd, I think moving forward, you have to address the parole problem, the probation problem of how long it is, because it's one of the longest in the nation, and work with judges and get a task force to take a look at how we're gonna, we can accomplish that. Thank you. Great, thanks. Patrick? I guess I would agree with pretty much everything that's being said. I think that the idea that if you're a convicted felon, you serve your time, but once you finish serving your time, you're not actually restored to your previous rights. You're really not done serving your time until the end of your life. I think. The logic in there seems a little faulty to me. So I would definitely be interested in looking at options where perhaps the suspension of your voting rights is part of that punishment. But once you finish your, your service, once you pay for the crime that you committed, I would be very interested in the restoration of voting rights to those people. And I think that's part of the integration, which I think most people would agree is kind of the end goal following a conviction is to then integrate that person back into society as a productive member. One of those things is voting. So I would agree with that. Thank you. Dave? Yes, I'm strongly supportive of this. Um, and, uh, and actually, there's bipartisan support in the House um, for this proposal that when people are, are out on probation or parole, that they be allowed to vote along with the other things, other, those other rights that they're doing. Um, but this is something that got blocked by the, by the majority um, in the House, Republican majority, um, and did not allow it to get a, a committee hearing or move it up for a vote. Um, I'm so glad to hear the, the positive comments about it because um, I think it's important for folks to understand that um, prosecutors and others um, are saying that, yeah, this is a really important step. And if people are out in the community doing other things, um, as was said, we want them to feel um, a part of our society and, and, and doing what they're doing. Um, there's a range of how this is handled around the country. There are a number of, there are several states where people in prison actually are voting. Um, at the very, we certainly should be, and there's, again, there's broad agreement on this, we should make it happen, that if people out in the community paying taxes, doing what they're doing, um, that they should be participating in our democracy by voting. We should finally get a vote on this and pass it. Thank you. So Minnesota has a pretty well-known achievement gap in education. Um, what would you do, what, what can you do to help close that achievement gap? And we'll start with Patrick. So I actually just recently read a study about this. I think there's a lot of promising research in the field of before and after school programs as far as helping to close this gap because it provides a lot more support, a lot more stability, and a lot more exposure to different educational, I guess, ideas and concepts that you wouldn't get exposed to during the regular day. I've read a lot of studies that saying, actually, making school time line up with parents' schedules is actually higher productive, too, because it kind of takes away those couple hours where children are unsupervised and you know, they're not either getting an education or being with their family. So I think those programs look promising, and I would be interested and supportive of the idea of funding those further, doing more experiments, and making sure that they actually do work as they seem to be indicating they are. Great, thank you. Dave? So I'm really intrigued by um, the things, the ideas that Patrick has. I'd love to talk with him separately about that. Um, when I think about the opportunity gap in schools, um, uh, I think about those first couple years of life. So we should recognize that the gaps that we see in school, which are paralleled by other gaps in health and employment and other things, um, they're paralleled by gaps when students enter school, and they're paralleled by gaps in prenatal care. So moms of color receive less um, prenatal care and lower quality prenatal care. So no wonder when those kids are several years old there, when they're entering school and in school, um, of course there are gonna be gaps, and no wonder the schools then are gonna have a really hard time closing those gaps. Um, I was uh, just speaking today actually with um, with, uh, with a professor with some expertise in this who's pointing out that in general our schools are pretty good actually at doing what they're asked to do of, of providing a year's worth of education and he said that even in the gaps, um, that generally those gaps stay steady. What's really, really hard is to lessen those gaps when the input is that way. So that's why I'm trying to focus a lot of my effort and energy on those first couple of years because if we can get that right, then schools can do very well um, with, with the kids uh, after that. But of course, when they're entering with gaps, uh, it's no wonder they're gonna be leaving with gaps given all the other factors involved. Thank you, Alex. Yes, thank you. I think it's crucial that we uh, hit kids and get them educated very early on. And that's why uh, the majority has always, and I will continue to support the early targeted uh, 
scholarships to people, you know, to areas that need it the most. Because if you can target the areas that need it, like Representative Pinto said, uh, that is the most crucial thing is to make sure the kids are getting uh, early childhood care and, and education, and through the scholarships we can make sure they're working for where, where it needs it the most. And I'm also very interested what Mr. Uh, what Patrick said. I think that's a good idea as well to look at and explore. Thank you. Great, thank you, Colleen. Um, so I would agree, actually, uh, with Dave. Um, I think that if we can address some of these issues early on, that we don't have to then in the back end try to figure out how to close this gap. But I also like to add one more thing to that: is that um, you know when our families and our children are experiencing food insecurity, and they're experiencing they don't have stable housing, and they have economic insecurity, that a child's ability to learn is not just about the time that they're in school. That if they're not rested, they're not fed, that they don't have security, that they don't have the ability to find all of the things that help their basic needs they're not going to be able to learn. And so I feel like it's really important for us not just to look at closing that achievement gap as what is the education that's being provided, but what are all of the other pieces in which uh, how the child's life, all of those pieces intersect and create an environment which then creates the disparities. Thank you. So I'm going to read this directly from the card. Minnesotans treasure the outdoors and our environment. We have chosen to dedicate funding to protect and enhance our natural resources. Dedicated funding comes from the state lottery proceeds and legacy fund sales tax proceeds. Will you oppose efforts to use these funding sources for any purpose other than their original intent? We'll start with Alex. Uh, so the legacy amendment was voted on by the people of the state and it passed. Uh, we put a lot of money, and Minnesotans take a lot of pride in their uh, outdoor recreations, uh, boating, fishing. We have a very long heritage of it, and I'm proud of our state for taking care of, of our, our natural resources and our ability to hunt and fish in the future. Uh, I would make sure that those funds are dedicated to what they're supposed to do, making sure that we have clean water, um, good natural resources protection. Um, so that's why I would just I would make sure it would go to exactly that. So yes. Great. Thank you, Patrick. I would have to agree. I think I don't think there's any excuse for misallocating funds. Uh, I think the being voted on in the constitutional amendment, as it was, these funds should go to what they were designated for. And I agree that I think what they're designated for is a valid and worthy cause too. I actively use many of the resources that these uh, these funds have provided for, and I think most Minnesotans do. So I would love to see them continue on. I think they're an important source of pride for Minnesotans, and I think one of the important things is that brings us together as Minnesotans and help, helps build our identity together. So absolutely, I think they should be maintained, and I think those funds should go to what they were designated for. Thank you. Dave? Well, I, I agree uh, that they should be dedicated, um, but there's another step beyond that, which is that um, there are uh, outside groups uh, that were established to really examine possible uses of those funds and proposals and accept proposals and examine them and make recommendations. And up until recently, those recommendations were given a tremendous amount of respect by the legislature. These are groups that are really diving in and looking. Um, just in the last uh, couple years, there have been a number of examples of where um, uh, the legislative committees have gone in and have made significant changes to those recommendations and have said, well, even though those citizen groups have done this exam, and say the fund should be spent in this way, well, actually, we would like to send it to that um, favored project or that favored project. Um, to my mind, that is um, sort of another distortion of that dedication uh, in the, in the uh, state constitution and that dedication of saying these are funds that are meant to be used in this way uh, to be put not to use of anybody's pet project, but to be used to, um, uh, for the legacy that we have um, as a state. And so I not only would uh, oppose any diversion of funds, I'd oppose um, that approach as well. Great. Colleague. I would agree with my fellow colleagues up here, um, and uh, I don't think I would have much more to add to that. Great, thank you. Um, so given that Minnesota has a relatively low unemployment rate, do you feel that our economy um, should be experiencing stronger economic, we should be experiencing stronger economic growth? If so, what factors do you feel are limiting the expansion of Minnesota's economy at this time? And we'll start with Dave. Well, it's, um, this has really been a, a sort of a mystery um, in our state and around the country that even that, that in the past, economic growth has been accompanied by wage growth, that people are, receive, are seeing a bump in their paychecks. Um, 
we have not been seeing that um, as, as much. Um, and again, that really goes beyond our states. Our state has done economically pretty well. We know that there are huge disparities as we've been talking about. Um, and, uh, and what drives that? There's probably a lot of factors. Um, but I, I will simply note that we need to be really careful as we're considering our taxing taxing and spending um, to be recognizing that just because there is general economic growth does not mean that it is broadly shared um, and that actually uh, you can have a, a pretty small percentage of folks who are doing extremely well, which is great, um, but others who may not be doing well at all. And we need to make sure to be, to be lifting up everybody if we're only because that's how we all are going to be doing well economically and other ways um, in the long run. We want every single person to have the opportunity um, to contribute and thrive um, and give their best. Um, so, uh, and right now we are not not seeing that accompany the wage growth. Great, thank you. Coley? So I just want to piggyback a little bit off of what Dave said as well, is that, um, you know, we've seen uh, record, um, record highs in the market and that those who have been invested in it and those who are some of our uh, top earners and top investors have seen uh, record returns. And so um, that makes me question the fact of that we are, what we're actually seeing is a greater disparity within uh, from our richest and our poorest Minnesotans. And so um, for me, it's really about looking at why those disparities continue to exist and why it is that our uh, middle class and our, our uh, families who are at the lower rung of the economic class are not doing better. Thank you. Alex. Uh, there, there is a lot of uncertainty. There's, the economy is doing very, very well, and I think the reason is being is because of the, the, the new tax codes. Uh, I think we see a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uh, wage, not, not growth, is because there's still uncertainty of what's the government going to do next with more regulations, what are companies going to have to do. So they're passing on the, with the more regulations. And I think it's not just rich people who are, in, are doing really well with the growing economy. I think a lot of people's 401ks, um, pensions are all going up as well. So we're, we're, it's coming across very well with the tax cuts, and they've actually been working. And I think a lot of people are experiencing um, uh, success, I think the wage gap will begin, the wages will begin to grow in the future. I'm confident, I feel confident about that. Okay, thank you. Patrick? So I guess I'm going to take this a little bit differently than everybody else. One issue which I see is actually the unemployment rate is, the low unemployment rate is somewhat of a sign of an issue that we might be facing, which is a labor shortage, in fact. Um, I know Minnesota has been running into the issue of attracting good talent to, uh, to our state, and that's, you know, a combination of a variety of factors taxes, and admittedly climate to a certain extent, and different you know, situations, our infrastructure, everything we have here. So I think one area which I think there's valid issues raised elsewhere, but one thing we can't forget to focus on is how do we actually attract talent to our state, which goes into some more esoteric things like housing and, and tax codes and you know, the culture and the recreation we have, and a lot of those amenities which don't, you can't quantify them well, but they're just as important. So I think that's an important focus, and I think that is part of the domain of the government to help promote that. So. Thank you. So the next question is on gun violence. Uh, what do you feel would be the most effective way to address gun violence in this country? Um, what could be done, if anything, to prevent gun violence, and what will you do specifically on this issue? We're going to start with Coley. So I think that we begin by having sensible gun laws. So um, I always begin this by um, by stating the fact that I am actually uh, a hunter. I come from a long line of hunters. And so we understand uh, what it means to have the responsibility of a firearm. And I feel like in, we have not been able to instill um, the importance of people understanding uh, the power of a firearm and uh, how we be how we can be responsible for that and so my feeling is that I think we need to do more about looking at uh, specifically uh, registering guns to individual gun owners um, that we have stricter background checks that we provide mental health care and mental su and uh, support for those who um, are uh, and not give access to those who should not have access to firearms and so um, I feel like they're just if we have sensible gun laws that will be able to help curb some of that gun violence that we're experiencing now Okay, thank you. Patrick? So I guess I would agree there's, there's certain things we can do with gun laws to hopefully reduce these crimes. One thing that I'm interested in, I think this partly comes from just the fact that I'm a recent graduate from university, and given my age, I think we can solve issues on a surface level, but I think we also have to go deeper to what the root cause of a lot of, not just gun violence, but violence is in general, which is what I see, at least in my generation, thinking about specifically the recent, um, you know, violence by, by 
students in high schools and, and universities is a lot of the mental health issues underlying there, including anxiety, depression, and some of these mental illnesses which are skyrocketing. And what I see as probably a root cause of that is um, the state of social media and the state of communication between students and between generations too. I think that's, uh, more research is needed there, but I think that is one of the underlying issues that drives a lot of the, uh, the higher level violence that we see above it. So I think more investigation in that area is important. Thank you, Dave. So the U.S. has a rate of gun death that is way higher than any other country we would want to compare ourselves to, and really comparable to countries that are experiencing war. Um, we uh, uh, we need to take we need to recognize that it's not just high schools; it's a wide variety of areas um, that this that we're experiencing this in. Uh, so I'm the author of um, the bills for criminal background checks and for what are called extreme risk protection orders. That bill for criminal background checks just says that the same background checks that apply to most gun sales should apply to all gun sales with common sense exceptions. Um, these are proposals that are wildly popular. They're supported by the majority of NRA members and Republicans. They've been adopted in many other states, but in general that's been after those states have experienced um, tragedies. Um, those bills got bottled up this past session. Um, we're continuing to push. Um, these are really common sense, and the real thing that we need to do is to have the common sense and the will of the vast majority of, of Minnesotans and of Americans uh, to prevail on this issue, to say that when you have something that is this reasonable, we've got to be able to take action. Uh, and when we don't, it is deeply, deeply irresponsible. Um, so I certainly hope that, hope and, and, uh, and really pray that we can, can make some progress on this issue. As a prosecutor, I see um, the impact of gun violence in my work um, every day, and, um, and I want us to, to finally do something about it. Thank you. Alex. Yes, thank you. Uh, gun violence is a very bad, terrible thing that's happening in our society. However, 56% of Minnesotans own, or 50 of Minnesotans own a gun. I think we do need to educate our kids. I think we need to teach kids what to do if they do find a gun. Also part of the problem is we're not enforcing the laws we do have. 80% of gun violence, according to the National Bureau of Criminal Investigation, says that uh, the guns are done, crimes are committed with the gun, the owner, the gun person, the person with the gun is not the owner. We need to go after people who break the law. In 2012 and 13, the Democrats majority passed a law that would prohibit uh, people with uh, stalker and uh, domestic violence from owning a gun. That passed and was signed into law. What we found out is people are not enforcing that law. That's a good law that needs to be enforced. I think we just need to go after and prosecute people who break the law with guns. And I think that's a good step in the right direction. Thank you. So after the census, um, uh, excuse me, <laughs> forgive me. What would you do to establish a nonpartisan process for re redistricting after the census? We're going to start with Patrick. So I actually did some research in this in one of my classes in, in college, and I think the interesting approach would be actually to change our voting system at its root. So today we vote in a first-past-the-post system, which simply says that the person with the most votes wins. And it sounds simple and it sounds fair, but it leads to a many, I guess, negative consequences which aren't immediately foreseeable. Uh, I know Minneapolis past the ranked voting. And uh, statistically, that, that shows many solutions to gerrymandering, many solutions to misrepresentation, many solutions to lost votes. I think exploring some of those options for St. Paul and for the statewide, I think those are absolutely things we should look into. Um, I know a variety of other nations are adopting those, and in general, those are leading to governments which are more representative, more representative, excuse me, of the people and their views. So I think that would be an interesting place to start. Great, thank you. Alex. Uh, so I, I believe that currently our system was the legislator decides and that gets reviewed by the judges. I don't think there's a, there's never gonna be a fair way of doing it. We can't have an independent panel because there's always gonna be uh, natural biases. Uh, I believe that right now Minnesota has a very fair way of doing it. Uh, I think there's bills that would, uh, we can't just let a judge on elected body, we choose our elected officials. They're there to make the choices for us and represent us. And that is what has worked, and I will continue to support uh, looking at always different ways, you know, bringing more people, more studies, um, to make it as fair as humanly possible, but I think the current system works just well. Okay, Kali. So I think that when you put people together who have specific interests that they want to achieve, that sometimes the outcome is not always what we uh, would like to see. 
And so what I, I think that we need to have more involvement from our citizens in participating in this process. And I don't even know if this is an option that is doable or that is even possible, but I feel like I wouldn't want to take the responsibility away from our current um, legislators uh, who are charged with doing this, but I feel that there should be uh, an independently appointed group of uh, um, knowledgeable citizens who can participate in the process and who can um, oversee this work so that politics doesn't take over uh, the redistricting, uh, uh, redistricting process. Great, thank you. Dave. So there's a reference to voters picking their elected officials and the fact is that uh, that with current technology, it really is that if the elected officials are drawing the lines, they pick their voters. And the picking of the voters then impacts the picking of the elected officials. We see in other states, Minnesota has fair lines because in fact, it has not been the case. Our current lines were not drawn by, by the legislature. In other states, we've seen this, that there are lines, there are these crazy districts as they're grabbing all kinds of voters um, and really skewing the results. Um, uh, it is long past time that we have a nonpartisan redistricting process. This is used in, um, in other states, an independent process. It's used in a number of other states. It's worked out very well. Um, there was a proposal to do this this spring. This did get a vote, um, and, the, um, and the majority voted it down um, to continue to select, to select their own voters. Um, uh, we have to have confidence in our democracy, and when we have lines that are picked by the people who then are picking their own voters, um, that is not something that inspires confidence in democracy. Um, this is really something that we need to, need to take action on. Great, thank you. So Minnesota has been a top, top destination for refugees coming to the United States. Do you feel that Minnesota is accepting too many refugees, not enough? And in your opinion, how should the state be involved in refugee resettlement? We'll start with Alex. So I believe that there's a reason people want to come to Minnesota. I love living in this state. It is a wonderful place. I don't think we're taking too many refugees. I don't blame refugees for wanting to come here. This is where it's supposed to be. We're the city on the hill. I think we need to make sure the federal government is investigating and doing background checks to make sure people who come and work hard and contribute to our society they're allowed to come. I think it's a great thing to let people come, and we're a great place to come to, and we need to continue that tradition of Minnesota welcome. Is Minnesota nice? And I think we should continue it, but I, need, I think we need to do, make sure that the people who are not gonna commit crimes are coming in, and we just do background checks, and I think we should work with the federal government on making sure that the people who are refugees and want to be better and want to live here, welcome, come on in. Thank you. Great, Kali. So as a refugee myself, this actually is a really important question to me. Um, I would say that um, we are a great destination for refugees because we have had the, um, the, we've seen success of our refugee populations in Minnesota here. And um, they have made huge economic contributions to our city here in St. Paul and to our state, and that we should continue because uh, to accept refugees, that we uh, understand the, uh, our Minnesota population is aging, and that we also are not having enough children to fill the for them to to uh, grow and fill into the positions that we will have in order to keep our economy going here in Minnesota. And so, unless we are able to fill that, um, we will be finding ourselves in um, some trouble uh, in the future here. And so, um, it is really critical that we continue to accept refugees, and uh, we work with organizations and agencies who've been doing it for a very long time. I spoke with one agency who said that their funding has been cut 50%. That they used to re they're resettling half of the number of families that they resettled last year. Uh, and so I think that we need to continue to find funding to help support them in this work and that they've done a fine job and we need to continue to support them in doing so. Thank you. Patrick. Well, I would agree that I think Minnesota is a great place um, to settle and we have a lot to offer. Just out of interest, I think that per dollar spent, um, we can spend money I think we should have a double-sided double, end, double -sided focus. We should focus on bringing families and people who are willing and ready to assimilate into our culture and become productive Minnesotans with us. But on the other side of that, I think we should also look at how our resources are being spent abroad in the places where these refugees are coming from because it's far easier and more effective to help them there and maintain their systems in their societies. Um, there's this the concept of brain drain internationally where we are sucking up the talent from other nations through processes like this. So I'd be interested in a two-sided focus where we focus more money on fewer people here with the idea of getting them into this state, giving them, setting them up for success rather than bringing them and then abandoning them, which I agree can happen. So I would like to see 
I guess, more concentrated wealth on the people who come here so that they actually have a good program coming in, and then more wealth abroad where we could actually help those people in their places of residence. Thank you. Dave. So I, I love the support for, for foreign aid and, 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 uh, and supporting folks in the countries they're coming from. I think people in general want to be in their homes, and the people who are fleeing from their homes are doing so because of really dire circumstances. Um, uh, we talked earlier about there being a labor shortage in our state, so I think it's important to recognize that when we accept refugees and immigrants, there may be a short-term cost, um, but in fact, statistics show them that uh, refugees and immigrants are contributing much more to our society over the long run, so we're not only benefiting more we're, we're, again, we're benefiting economically as well. Um, we're actually addressing the labor shortage that we have identified earlier as being a concern. Um, so I love the idea and think it makes complete sense to do what we can, probably more at the federal level than at the state, to help to support um, countries people are coming from, but then certainly to be welcoming in our state, um, recognizing that uh, the folks that we're helping benefit, but we all benefit much more as well. Great, thank you. Now, thinking about our state's um, infrastructure, if you had to give a letter grade to our state's roads and bridges, what would that grade be? And in addition, how would you prioritize infrastructure spending? We're going to start with Dave. So uh, I guess I would think a C is kind of the grade that's coming to mind. I mean, we've, we have, um, in many respects, we are living off of investments in the past. Uh, that made in the past, uh, and we need to be um, we need to be recognizing investments we make today will pay off in the long run. Um, we have a lot of needs. Um, you know, you mentioned roads and bridges, and I would add transit as well. Um, but wouldn't prioritize transit over those other things, right? We need to have a, a full multimodal system when it comes to transportation. Um, there are concerns about uh, about water treatment through, um, in other parts of the state. Um, one important component on this, uh, in the mid-90s, there was a billion-dollar bonding bill that was passed. That's the kind of bill where the state borrows money and invests it in infrastructure. Um, uh, since then, uh, there's been a, a, a cap of a billion dollars, generally the feeling around the legislature, even, the, even as a billion dollars buys so much less. Um, it certainly seems to me that we should have investments in infrastructure that reflect the mathematical reality of inflation, that recognize that we should be investing at least this, we should invest, investing, pardon me, the same amount um, that we have in past years, reflecting inflation and making the investments we need. Thank you. Alex. Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, transportation is crucial to our state. It's how we get our food, how we move around, how to get to work on time. Uh, the good news is we put $5.2 billion in new spending in, in roads and bridges over the next 10 years. Uh, we've done a lot to make sure that we're having, we're building roads and we're addressing our, bridge, our bridges. Uh, but what also to help move our, our transportation and infrastructure forward is I support a constitutional amendment that allows uh, sales, uh, auto part tax and sa auto sales tax to be dedicated to the uh, transportation, like the gas tax. That is, the future is here, folks. The good news is we're using less gas. The bad news is we're losing less glass, which is where most of our dedicated funds to roads and bridges are for. So we need to start using responsible and reasonable reforms to move us forward. And I think using your tires, for example, is what would go into that fund. Uh, you're, you're buying a new car. That is going to be something that can move us forward as, as we use less and less gas, which is very important, I think. And we need to look to the future. Thank you. Patrick. So I guess I would agree with Alex. I think that's an interesting idea, and I think that would probably be the best way to move forward with scaling funding to the need. Uh, as we move away from gas, gas necessarily isn't the best metric on which to base funding for our own infrastructure. Oh, I forgot to start with the grade. Um, C sounds reasonable to me. Um, and as far as where it should be spent first, I think heavy infrastructure, the important safety things like bridges, and then you know trickling down to the smaller parts. But linking how we how we appropriate money to uh, infrastructure maintenance, I think tying it to things like the sale of auto parts, so tires, all your different you know transmission, your your oils, everything, all those parts of cars that are still going to be sold even though you're not selling gasoline anymore. I think tying that to that level of spending on auto-related costs is going to be the best way to scale our spending to the actual usage of those roads, which is the rate at which they deteriorate, roughly. So I know roads occupy somewhat of a monopoly spatially, and so I think we have to introduce the best metrics we can to track the use and the where and how we can scale our funding appropriately. Thank you. Kali. Um, so I would give us a grade of a C as well, but maybe a C minus. <laughs> I do believe, uh, as Dave is saying, that we are sort of living off the legacy of the investments that have been made. Um, 
and uh, we need to start investing more into our roads and our bridges. That, um, for me, looking at how um, we actually fund these projects, right? So I'm thinking about in St. Paul, we have uh, two particular bridges that are literally falling apart, and uh, for us to advocate to have those bridges um, repaired has been quite the challenge, and I think that for, uh, for me, it's really about looking at how do we then look at equitably funding different projects and how do we ensure that the projects with the most needs are the ones that are being looked at. And I don't always feel like that process, it's always who, whoever is able to navigate uh, the state legislature and the individuals who have power, that are the ones who usually get their projects taken care of. And so for me, it's really looking about equity. If I have a bridge that connects uh, uh, an area of low socioeconomic, um, families from low socioeconomic backgrounds uh, to uh, centers of commerce that uh, we we need to really look at that and say how do we ensure that those people have the access that they need to get to work as well so it's looking at uh, project priorities and how we do so equitably great thank you so according to census data economic recovery continues to boost some Minnesotans incomes but this prosperity is not reaching all Minnesotans what should the state's role be in increasing jobs available in low-income communities and providing training as needed? We're going to start with Koli. Can you repeat the last part of that question for me yeah, real quick? Sure. So um, what should the state's role be in increasing jobs available, job availability in low-income communities and providing training, training as needed? Sure. Um, I don't know if I necessarily agree that it is the state's job to do that. I think that uh, local uh, municipalities know their communities and know their needs greater than anyone else would. And so um, I, I think that the state kind of doing what it did um, in the last session where they had a, a pool of funds to support um, uh, organizations uh, from uh, um, I want to say uh, organizations from diverse backgrounds, right? For they're the ones that uh, they allocated funds to those organizations to do workforce development, to um, uh, to fund um, the needs within those communities of how to develop it in the best way. And so I believe that maybe the state's uh, job is really to allocate funds that can be distributed to organizations that are embedded in those communities to do that kind of work. Great, thank you, Dave. So yeah, it's, uh, it seems to me that the state uh, can do a lot in partnership with the local governments that, that Kali mentioned. Um, the state has access to resources those local governments um, don't as much. Um, uh, and um, you know the the infrastructure, the, the governmental responsibility, right, is to help um, help ha have there be an infrastructure within which folks can um, uh, can thrive and can um, uh, and supporting small business development, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but so much of that does need to be led by local governments, um, but in partnership and with the support um, of the state. Um, I'll note too that um, that we need to recognize that all these pieces are are wrapped up in one another. Um, that yes, there's a there's the focus of having um, jobs in a particular area, um, but when you have um, the other disparities that we've identified, um, that can make it especially difficult for communities to sort of get going on their own. And so recognizing that all these people, all these pieces are tied in, um, and that when, um, uh, that as we're um, investing in closing opportunity gaps and, um, and other areas, that actually is going to then pay off to allow um, entrepreneurs to start their own companies and employ in their own communities. Great. Thank you. Alex. Yes. Thank you. I, I agree that the state really doesn't isn't have should have a role in, in creating jobs. Uh, I do believe we should be doing targeted grants, but I think it also starts up very early on with early childhood scholarships. I think it's also very important to make sure we have good technical schools and for kids out of high school to do uh, apprenticeships. You know, move, making sure we have a working community and making sure that the kids are educated to do that. Uh, I think that's where it starts is, is making sure that we have grants and everything ready to go that the state can help the local government address. But it all starts very early on and I think with high school and early on in education when they get started is will help in the long run. So that's my, my, my response. Thank you. Patrick? I guess I would have to say that I generally agree. I'm a pretty big proponent of home rule and I think that the communities know themselves better than anybody outside of them. So trying to delegate that responsibility down to the municipal level, I think would be an effective way of doing it. As far as uh, you know, funding and, and bringing in jobs into those areas, I think adopting a small business friendly stance would probably be the most effective way. I mean, it'd be hard, you know, it's hard to relocate an entire headquarters into anything remotely residential. 
but small businesses can get far closer and, and be far more immediately accessible. So that combined with a good transportation infrastructure, I think is probably the best solution, at least to start until we figure out how that actually works. Thank you. So Minnesota has an aging workforce. What policy innovations would ensure Minnesota has the qualified workforce it needs going forward? We'll start with Patrick. So well, I guess I think technology would probably play the biggest role in this area. And so I think technical education, as we offload more and more of our work onto computers and onto you know, artificial intelligences, I think training our young workforce to be tech savvy and familiar with, you know, with coding, with computers, with anything related to the tech sector, as that comes to dominate you know, multiple industries where you might not expect it to, a lot of design work being offloaded, and things that people think might escape that, there's still gonna be a digital element coming into pretty much every area of business. So I think educating our young folks early, I know the school I came from, not when I was there, but now they offer early education for, for programming for their students. And I think programs like that could be highly effective, highly effective at providing for that gap as our population ages. Thanks, Kuli. So, um I recently read a study that some of the uh, the industries in which we're having the hardest time filling are jobs in which we tradi we traditionally have not been focusing on in the last probably few decades because we um, that they may not necessarily require a college education for so trade programs. Um, uh, programs in which uh, our, uh, people can be trained for, such as uh, I was uh, talking with the transit um, system and they were telling us that they couldn't find enough mechanics actually to work on their buses and that we need to invest more on uh, school to career um, uh, programs and pipelines in addition to continue to invest in our, in our kids and in college education, that we need to also do a better job of investing in these, career to, to, uh, these, college, these schools to career uh, pipelines. Thank you, Dave. So I feel like there are so many angles to this. Um, the uh, uh, you know the edu the E twelve education system um, uh, gives folks the um, the basic preparedness um, that they need and needs to do that. Um, but then when it comes to workforce development, a lot of it is in in partnership and should be in partnership with employers. Um, we talked about um, the trades, and that can be a really good um, path for a number of um, uh, a number of folks. Um, and uh, and uh, and continue to public private partnerships with uh, with post secondary institutions um, and with uh, and with others as well. Um, I do want to note one one challenge that this made me think of um, uh, has to do with healthcare. Uh, if somebody uh, wants to start their own business, um, for example, um, right, and, and leave a leave a stable job, um, they find themselves um, thrust into um, an individual market um, where uh, you know because you get your health care through through your employer, so many people do. Um, that actually ends up being something that inhibits entrepreneurship and inhibits um, job growth. I would argue. Um, so all these things end up really being connected, and we need to make sure to to lift them all up. Great, thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, Trade jobs, uh, you know, you know, nice blue collar working jobs again is going to be great. Uh, the way we get there is what what the majority did was we redid teacher licensures so we can make it easier for people who are ex experienced in some of these fields to come in and go ahead and be teachers. We can attract those people into educating our kids into becoming uh, skilled labor. I think that's very important. I think introducing it into high schools and making sure kids know and are aware of it is very crucial. And I think that's a would be a crucial part of making sure that we have a, a labor force and then educating them about finances. No one knows how to balance a checkbook until they get a checkbook or how to navigate the healthcare system or how to navigate something. I think we need to teach kids how to manage their finances when they're young so we don't have problems when they get older as well. So it's all very crucial about that. Thank you. Great, thank you. So what are St. Paul's greatest transportation needs and how will you address those needs? We're gonna start with Alex. Excellent. So this year I had the privilege of riding in one of the new smart buses. Uh, I think we need more buses. I think buses are a great way. They're, they're very small and compact. I think we can invest in a big fleet of these small, quick buses. St. Paul streets aren't super wide, so those big, clunky buses that you're used to seeing take up a lot of space. So there's a lot smaller buses. We can have a lot more and have a lot uh, more options for people to get around. And the nice thing about buses is, as populations move, as everything shifts around, we can change our pattern and we can, we can work with the city of how it works, um, rather than have a set in stone guideways to do it. That's just not gonna work. That would 
that worked, you know, 200 years ago, but the future's here. Smart buses, smart cars, automated car driving, that's all here. I think we need to look at that, and it's going to be easier for people to get around uh, because of uh, the technology. Um, so it's not ti no time to go to the transportation of the past with, you know, big clunky trains and big clunky buses. Thank you. Dave. So um, being in a city, and, and there are challenges, of course, um, uh, uh, investing in roads, um, et cetera, but in streets. Um, but, uh, but for our city, as we are attracting more and more residents, um, greater and greater density, transit, it seems to me, is, is the transportation issue. Um, <clears throat> we had an amazing um, streetcar system back uh, decades and decades ago. Um, you could get um, all over the place on that system. Um, we are trying to have um, a, uh, a really uh, solid connected transit system and stumbling towards that um, as, a, as a community. Our family lives right on the A-line and, uh, and rides it regularly. I think a number of people in the district um, do as well. Um, we need to continue to support that and to recognize um, that at some point we won't be able to keep on attracting um, residents um, uh, if we don't have a really robust system. Um, there may be a role for smart buses. I suspect that there is a role for, for fixed guideway um, systems as well. Um, uh, I'm the author of the Riverview Corridor uh, bill to make sure there's a connection there between downtown and the airport, but we really need to make that investment. Thank you. Coley. So I agree with Dave in that this is actually, um, we can't just look at transportation from one angle. Um, I really want to focus on the lack of transportation in certain areas within our cities and within um, uh, and around our state that sometimes people want to use public transportations and they can't. I was speaking with a group of students from Harding <coughs> High School and I asked them about how they, um, their transportation methods to school and they said, oh, um, they, were ha they had issues and sometimes if they couldn't get a ride, they wouldn't go to school. And I asked why wouldn't they take the bus and they said, we're not on a bus route. And so for someone to uh, live in a specific area and not have direct routes to places that are critical for them, I think that we need to really focus on how do we expand routes, how do we expand access, and how do we ensure that all people have the same access to transportation. Thank you. Um, Patrick. I guess I would personally advocate for I think Dave used the phrase multimodal, multimodal previously, and I think that's kind of, that should be the key. I, I think a lot of people tend to get pretty divided on this issue and choose one over another, and I think, I guess I would, without trying to sound non-committal, I think not abandoning one for the other is probably the smartest way to move forward because it's true that if we lay down a fixed railway line, that would be set, but, you know, on the same hand, that the volume of people that that can move, or on the other hand, sorry, on the other hand, the volume of people that that could move is far exceeds what buses could move, but m buses do give you that flexibility and would probably give you far more ability to reach into neighborhoods where they might not have access, access to public transportation. So I think not devaluing any one of them and looking at their merits on the face, I think is probably the best way to move forward. It, anything's on the table for me. Thank you. So the next question is on minimum wage. Are you for or against a statewide increase in minimum wage, and why? Let's start with Dave. Well, um, a statewide minimum wage um, passed uh, several years ago, and there was a real debate as to whether it should be indexed to inflation, and it is. Um, so I'm very supportive of that. <clears throat> um, our local communities are looking at having municipal wages that are even higher. Um, I think that's something that at the state level we certainly should be should be exploring. Um, the good thing is that in the meantime, the minimum wage, <clears throat> pardon me, continues to continues to increase, um, which I think is important. Um, and uh, and it seems to me that as the municipalities are moving forward, and then counties and the larger communities, um, it uh, is likely going to make sense. I think we need to to recognize that there are a lot of people, despite as we've alluded to several times, despite the strong economy. Many families are struggling uh, very much. Um, I was volunteering at a homeless shelter in my church, um, and there are folks who are working two jobs, two parents working their jobs, and they're staying in a shelter because um, they are not making enough to take care of their families. Um, and we re need to recognize that and adjust wages to, to respond to that need. Thank you. Patrick. So I guess when that statewide uh, minimum wage increase went through, I was working as an assistant to the CEO of a small business. And I kind of saw firsthand how the impact that raise, what impact that raise had on him and his ability to hire, and just in an absolute sense, fewer people worked, and the m amount that we spent on our wages dropped. So fewer people were getting paid not much more money. And I think there has to be an honest accounting for where that money's going, and I, I agree there's probably a certain degree to which 
It could raise, which would increase wa raises, but increase wages. But there is such a thing as excess, and I think a statewide solution, I don't think it'll work. I, I like the idea of municipalities raising it so that you get a diversity, a diversity of minimum wages in these municipalities and essentially allow for competition between them so that people can gravitate to where that balance between wages and the amount of jobs kind of fits best so that you can hopefully hone into what that true value is for where the minimum wage should be. Thank you, Kali. So I do support a statewide minimum wage increase and I support it being at $15. Um, the reason why I say this is that if, if the minimum wage had kept up with inflation, that the minimum wage today would be about $18 or $19. And so what we're continuing to say is that those are our, our lowest earners, that we're leaving them behind and we're not um, allowing them to move even to, to stay up with inflation. And so I would support a $15 minimum wage. I would support it statewide. And uh, I hope that we have the will and the ability to do that. And that even at 15, that is not a livable wage. And that we need to really look at what are the other pieces that we need to put together in order to have economic justice for those who truly need it. Thank you. Alex. Uh, I agree with Patrick on this one. I, I, I do not support a statewide minimum wage increase. Uh, it, it is especially with, uh, it is a tax, uh, especially if you go to the $15 an hour one. If you actually work it out, and in the state of Minnesota, I'll just use the state alone, you go, a person, individual, will be go from the 5% tax bracket to the 7% just by that alone. So I think it's unfair. I also agree with Patrick that businesses do need to be held accountable for what happens with the money. I think businesses need to be upfront when they hire people. This is what we pay. This is our benefits. I think the key is, again, let's have a good, educated workforce that, and one that can contribute. Let's make sure we're teaching kids how to weld do codes and everything forward. It all starts with education and we need a stronger, better educated society, as well as less regulation, more lower, lower taxes. You'll get to keep more of your money and that will help too. In this age of global warming, I think there's a lot of concern about sustainability and um, environmental health. Could you talk a little bit about um, energy and any ideas you have to promote clean energy, if that's something you would do, and if so, how? Let's start with Kohli. So this is an issue that's actually really important to me and that um, I had experienced um, what it meant uh, to really um, go back to uh, living a really natural, really organic, very sustainable way of living because of an illness that my mother had. And so um, I feel like if for we need to invest more into uh, renewable energies. We need to invest more into uh, policies that really protect our lands and our water and our air. And uh, I feel like there has to be um, more investment in, in doing so. I think that some of the tax breaks that we've been providing for our energy companies, those who are investing in this area, uh, are uh, no, no longer exist. And that if we want to continue to grow and to do well and to develop in this area, that we need to put the investments in it to do so. Thank you, Alex. So I, again, I'll talk about how much I love Minnesota, how much we do a great job of taking care of our natural resources. I believe that Minnesota companies do do a good job of taking care of, uh, making sure we have uh, clean water. We put, a, we put a bunch of money, $35 million this year from the Legacy Fund went into making sure we have clean water. We take care of our state and our farmers take care of our states. So we don't need to regulate them either with the buffer laws. We need to trust Minnesotans that we do do a good job and then go after those who don't. Uh, people who do break the laws that we do have, they need to be punished, and we need to also trust each other that we're going to take care of each other, and I think that's very important. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Patrick. I guess this is just an opportunity for me to advocate for nuclear energy, which I think is probably our, our best, most affordable, and longest-term solution for our energy crisis. I agree that green energy is essential, and I think it is the future. I mean, the technology is moving that way, and the priority of the citizens is moving that way. And as we improve our technology, our ability to handle nuclear waste, our ability to secure it, our ability to secure our plants has improved along with it to the point where, you know, large-scale nuclear disasters are likely, hopefully, and statistically almost a thing of the past. I think that the state should look heavily into moving forward with that. And hopefully, once we set that up, that'll last us for generations to come. Thank you. Dave. So one of the biggest um, 
disappointments or one of the biggest challenges I've, I've felt the last couple of years is just the failure of my colleagues in the Republican majority to just acknowledge the reality of the issue of climate change. Um, the science is real. The science doesn't care whether we believe in it or not. It is, it is happening, and we're seeing it um, in uh, extreme weather events, and, and we're seeing it in so many ways. Um, uh, back in uh, 2006, I think it was, around that time, 2007, Governor Pawlenty and the DFL legislature agreed to a renewable energy standard to say we're going to generate more of our energy <coughs> renewables. Um, we beat those targets. Uh, it, we found that actually we could achieve that renewable energy target years ahead of time. Um, it is time that we push for the next level. We have so much more renewable energy now in wind and in solar than we have uh, uh, ever before. Um, but, but by not acknowledging the reality of it and not pushing towards it, in fact, if anything, going backwards on it, uh, we are putting uh, ourselves at risk um, uh, today and then certainly our children and our grandchildren. This is one issue that decades from now people will look back and they will be stunned that we did not take action. Thank you. We have time for just one more question. Um, so the question is, name one individual either alive or dead from the opposite party with, you know, with which you affiliate yourself, why you admire that person. That you admire and why, excuse me. And we'll start with Patrick. Shoot. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think this through. Probably. That's a tough question as far as um, I'm thinking through kind of our history and the, the names that stand out are presidents. I guess what I would say would be the, the Gilded Age presidents for me, so between you know, 1870 and 1900, um, say Grover Cleveland. I think those are actually models that we should look towards because we don't remember their names, which honestly I think is a good thing. I think that's, in, that's a sign that the president wasn't inserting himself into the public domain, controlling and, and directing from the executive branch beyond what the Constitution allowed for. So that's something like Calvin Coolidge, I admire him greatly. He's not well remembered, and I think that's a reason to remember him, because he didn't do anything beyond what he was constitutionally mandated to do. He allowed the system to run as it was intended. So I think a lot of those Gilded Age Democrat presidents did their job in doing just what they had to do, nothing more and nothing less. Thank you. Dave. So all kinds of names spring to mind, but I guess I'll, I'll choose a Minnesotan, um, Dave Durenberger, um, who was a U.S. Senator in the in the 80s, um, and uh, and probably on a number of issues, you know, wouldn't necessarily align to where um, to where I would, um, but he uh, um, held that job with um, with great dignity, um, uh, became an expert in healthcare policy, um, and I really admire. Um, just that diving in, and as a as a legislator, as a federal legislator, of course, um, to dive into an issue area to really get to know it very, very well. Um, he continued to do that work outside the Senate. Um, I've gotten to know him um, somewhat since then, um, and have really um, just um, grown to really admire uh, his work and his approach to it, um, and would love to be able to follow along in that same way. Great, thank you, Alex. Uh, I would have to say, who I've been reading about lately, it just comes to my mind right away, is because I've been reading a lot of books about uh, Linda Baines Johnson. He was just a fascinating man who uh, pushed through some incredible legislation with uh, extreme uh, opposition, especially about civil rights. But he was just a just a character. If you read The Master of the Senate, it is an interesting read. Uh, but he is someone I admire because he's just a just an interesting character. Not that I agree with him on a lot of stuff, but he's, he intrigues me. I think he'd be enjoyable to have a, a, a dinner with. That's great. Coley. So I would have to say that it's uh, John McCain. I did not always agree with his politics. I didn't agree with his positions. Um, sometimes I, I loathed some of the positions that he took, but I always, I always respected and admired his courage for standing up when he saw that something was not right. And the first time when I, he, that I had hope in a really long time was during the, uh, one of his um, uh, rallies in which somebody called uh, uh, then uh, President Obama uh, before he was president that they called him a Muslim and he stood up in the face of people who really wanted to be angry about that and he said that's not true and that gave me so much hope in what it is that we can do together that we can move away all the things that are fiction and yet we can still work together to move along the agenda and I, he gave me great hope. Thank you. So we're now going to move into our two-minute closing statements, and we're going to start with Alex. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all again for coming out, and thank you again for the League of Women Voters and the other candidates again. It was a good experience, I think a good conversation. Um, 
normally this is time where you start promising of everything I would deliver. I, I can't do that. I just want to continue to make Minnesota to move it forward. I think no matter uh, what creed, motto, where you come from, what neighborhood you live in, what part of the state, uh, rural or urban, I think we're one Minnesota. I think that's a good thing. I think we're all in this together, and I want to continue that story as we move forward. Uh, Minnesota, one Minnesota together moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So I want to thank the league as well, and, and certainly the other candidates. Um, it uh, uh, gives me good hope for our democracy that we can have um, a good um, conversation like this um, on a day like this um, in this setting. So thank you. Um, it's been such an honor to be um, serving the district uh, for these last two terms as a state legislator. Um, and I've uh, worked really hard in that time um, to, to live up to my just phenomenal constituents. Um, uh, I love um, serving them and representing them. Um, and I've tried to bring uh, an approach that is respectful, that is focused, um, that is energetic and thoughtful um, to, um, to both uh, uh, a narrower set of issues, because you have to be focused as a legislator, but then also trying to bring that in a broader sense um, to the institution and to the relationships and to the work um, that I do. Um, and I've tried in doing that to always think about the future generation and say, um, are we building things that, um, that our kids and our grandkids um, can be can be appreciating and can be benefiting from. And that's the test that I've tried to apply to, to each of the things uh, that I'm doing, each of the votes that I cast, and, and the work that I do. And, uh, and I'd be honored to be able to continue doing that uh, for another term for the residents of the district. Thanks again. Thank you. Colleen. So I also want to uh, say thank you to the League and for all of you who are here tonight who sent in such thoughtful questions um, for all of us to think through. Um, I am a first-time candidate. I've never been a politician before, and I operate from the heart of a mother, of a daughter, as a wife, and that sometimes I don't always have the answers. I don't understand the structures in which that we've been creating laws and policies under, but I do understand that, and I do know that, uh, that if we have a will, that we have the ability to achieve the goals that we want to around safety and security and education and health care and uh, all the things that we need to do in order to ensure that our state continues to be the great state that it is and that I have much to learn, but I am here to learn and I am a quick learner and that I promise that uh, uh, in this day and age when our progressive values are under attack, that I am here to, for, to fight for progressive values, that I am here to ensure that, that equity uh, exists in the work that we do, and that I'm here to represent all Minnesotans and not just the people within my district. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and the opportunity to share my views and my thoughts and my ideas with all of you. Thank you. Patrick. Well, I do also want to say thank you to the League of Women Voters and all the other sponsors for having us all here tonight and to the other candidates for coming as well as to all the attendees. I was really surprised by how much I think we agreed on certain issues. I mean, it's just what you hear in the news kind of gives you an impression of what the state of, of discourse like this would be, uh, just what's happening on both the state and the national Capitol Hill, I think gives people a negative opinion of the other side without ever having met them. And I've kind of discovered that in doing this is that people have these pre, I guess, preformed notions of what the other side, however they see the other side, what they are, and I think that conversations like this is the best way to dispel with that. And so I would advocate for more of this as much as we can, wherever we can, and whenever we can. So I wanted to thank all of you for being up here and, and talking tonight. And that, you know, nobody, I, very few people in our society are evil, and I think that it, we owe it to each other to give each other the benefit of the doubt, and that we actually do want the best for each other, not just ourselves, but each other. So I would advocate for that, and that's what I'm running on. I'm a first time candidate, too, and so I'm. I'm learning as I do this, and I've really gained a lot of faith in the, the strength of our institutions as I've done this. So thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you again to our candidates and to the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. I'd also like to thank again Union Park, um, the McGroveland and Highland District Councils, and to remind everybody that voting day is November 6, if that is not on your calendar already. There is a lot of information on the Secretary of State's wonderful website where you can learn more about voting early by mail or in person. It's really worth checking out. Um, also, the candidates have all agreed to stay for a few minutes after the event if you have any additional questions and you want to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you all for coming, and let's give a round of applause to our candidates. <laughs> 